introduce our next speaker. Uh, I used to work with him many years ago in a newspaper called the Blackpool Gazette. And I once picked up uh, a copy of the paper on the Monday when I started work and read the match report that he'd written from the weekend about Blackpool's game. It was a bit unusual because in the first four parts it didn't mention the game, but it was very, very entertaining. Uh, and he made it sound a lot more enjoyable than I'm sure it was for a mundane League One game. Uh, Steve covered Blackpool uh, a wonderful time for the club when they somehow went from being the middle of League One uh, into the Premiership in just under three years. He's gone on to win awards for his feature writing and also now writes for BBC Sport. And last year his uh, fame spread internationally with an uh, acclaimed American author crowned him the UK's best newspaper columnist. Uh, with the killer quote being, unlike literally everybody at the New York Times, Steve can get a column out of anything. So I'd like you to please give a warm welcome to Steve Canavan. Thanks very much. That makes me sound a lot better than I actually am. I think I've basically blagged my entire career so far, uh, which means there's hope for everyone in this room, I guess. Uh, we've only got half an hour, so I'm going to keep this nice and short and sweet, which is probably, you know, music to all your ears. Uh, and I just want to talk about, I'm going to talk about, I work for BBC Sport Online now. But I guess a lot of people have already talked to you about how the industry is massively changing, how it's all going from print to online, and the importance of social media and Twitter, so, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll, I'll sort of stay clear of that a little bit. And I want to talk to you specifically about, about being a football writer, I think, because it's made up the bulk of my career. I did it for 11 years, took over at the Blackpool Gazette as the chief football writer in 2002, when Blackpool were absolutely awful. They had the worst stadium in the country. The training ground had been going since the 1940s. Uh, it was just a horrible place uh, and I took over because I desperately wanted to be a football writer. I think for a lot of people who are into sport when they're younger uh, and you're into your writing as well, then it's kind of like a dream job and it was. If any of you get a chance to become a football writer, do it. It's absolutely fantastic. I can't, I can't say there's not a better career out there to do. It's fantastic. As a kid, I always wanted to be a writer. Kept scrapbooks and my local team, Berry, were my club, uh, the Mighty Shakers. Uh, and uh, used to sit with a tape recorder, this is going back 20 years when we had tape recorders, and spoke into it, pretended I was doing commentary on games. Bit of a sad child, really, thinking back. But anyway, it was the way I, I knew I wanted to be a writer. I love football, so it was a natural thing to me. But being a football writer, there comes challenges with it. And I just want to play you this. So I dealt with several Blackpool managers. Uh, and this, to me, this one clip sums up the utter brilliance of being a football writer and also the utter sort of bonkers nature of it, whereby you can ask a manager, and this is where you need to be really good at building up relationships with people, whether it be players, managers, chairmen, that's where you get your stories from. You can ask a manager what you think is a perfectly normal question, perfectly reasonable, and they can absolutely go off on one for no apparent reason. Alex Ferguson used to do it all the time at Man United. He'd ban I think he'd banned something like 47 newspapers different, different amount of times by the time his 22 year reign had come and he was a, a bad manager to deal with. Ian Holloway wasn't like that but he, he was very very volatile and if anyone has heard Ian Holloway in the past and knows him they'll know what kind of a boss he was. I remember him doing an interview about uh, Wayne Rooney when Wayne Rooney handed a transfer request and again it went absolutely ballistic. Call Wayne Rooney Shrek all the way through the interview with Sky Sports. It went everywhere. He didn't have an off button Ian Holloway. So basically this is when Blackpool played Aston Villa in the Premier League in 2010. Aston Villa won 3-2, it was a great game. Blackpool made 10 changes from the game. Not, no one quite, no one's sure why really, uh, but he made 10 changes and someone as a match started and said, oh, that contravenes Premier League rules actually. You're only allowed to make seven changes from one game to the next. It would constitute a weakened side. So obviously, he was asked about this afterwards. Me, the great thing about working for the local paper is you get special privileges. So me and the, the bloke from the local radio, we used to interview Ian Holloway separately, or whoever the Blackpool manager was separately in a little, in the tunnel somewhere. And then Ian Holloway will be led, this is how they do it, they lead you into a bigger room like this, where all the members of the national press are sat down, and then they ask their questions. So we'd asked Ian Holloway, we said to him, oh, by the way, do you know, there's, there's, you might get, there's a £25,000 fine for changing your team. And he looked at us like, as though we were, we were nutters, and said, oh, that, that'll never happen, blah, blah, blah. But he obviously sowed a seed. So he goes into his national press conference, and one of the first questions is, you may, you've, you've fielded a weakened side, you're going, to, uh, you're going to be facing a fine. And this is how he reacted. And let some person from the Premier League even try 
to tell me who I can pick. I am the manager of Blackpool Football Club and I select people to come to the club and play them whenever I want. And how dare you suggest that I think I've got more of a chance to beat West Ham than I have Aston Villa. Because I'm going to come here and I'm going to try and beat West Ham and I'm going to go to... Uh, I'm going to come here and try and beat Aston Villa and I'm going to go to West Ham and try and beat them and all. And if I pick a different team, I've got every right to do what I like. So what? Have they still got to find 25 Well, I don't care. How wrong are those people? Let them try and find me. It's an absolute disgrace. How well did my team play? Didn't you see the game? So what are you talking about there? Who is? Me? No chance. No, they won't. That's not a weakened team. Absolute rubbish. Well, I'll show the Premier League what, why. Who are they to tell me? That's rubbish. Absolute nonsense. I'm t- how dare you even say that? I, I am so offended for my players that I've signed this summer. I haven't even given them a chance yet. How dare you say that? How can I be fine for picking a team that nearly beat Aston Villa and deserved at least a draw? No, I don't care what happened to Wolves. I never even paid any attention what happened to Wolves. Not at all. I got up at 6 o'clock in the morning knowing this is the right thing to do. It's about encouragement. I can't keep picking 11, 11, 11 when the other ones are trying their heart out and I'm never giving them a chance. What are you on about? I knew all the way along this season, whatever the scores were, I'm going to reward the ones who played well for me last year and then I'm going to try some new ones. Dare you say that I played a weakened team? I think the press will agree with you. Well, they're not doing that to me, are they? And I'd like to see them try, with the greatest respect. If you try and find the club in, what, what would your reaction be? Oh, well, I'd just pack in. I, I can't work for this madness. I would resign. What? You don't know what you're talking about. They do not know what they're talking about. I agree with you. We agree with you. Well, no, I'm just telling you. They can find me for that, if they like. How much more is it going to find me for opening my mouth? But I believe in what I do, and I believe in the people I've brought. And I'm, I'm even more adamant that Blackpool Football Club represented itself absolutely magnificent on and off the field this evening, so much so that pe- other people in the world can't believe it. Absolutely not. What are you talking about, pal? Aren't you listening? Aren't you li- Hello? Can you see me? With the greatest respect, what is the point of me sat here? My wife's waiting for me, and you ask me the same stupid questions over and over again. And you're transfixed by the Premier League and what they might do to Blackpool. How dare you? And how dare you presume that I think Aston Villa are a safe bet to stay up and West Ham ain't? Absolute disgrace. This team and my team were that close. And it, I damn well know that if I play my players 12 days apart, four times in a row at this level, they will get it. It goes on and on and on and on and on like that. Because that's the first part of the three-part clip. I won't bore you with the rest. But that, to me, sums up what football writing's all about. I, I, Ian Holloway was a, a bizarre character, but, but, but great. But did you hear that? I don't know if you heard in the background there what the journalists were asking. The, the, no one has said anything at all unreasonably. They were trying to help him. They were trying to encourage him. But when you've got a manager who's emotional straight after a match has finished and thinks he's been wronged or slighted, he will just go off on one, and it's very difficult to get back. Footballers are exactly the same. If you go into football writing, you, you've got to have a thick skin. Footballers, the worst thing I found about, about being a football writer was giving the marks out of 10. So you'd have your Monday match spread and you'd give each player a mark out of 10 on the left-hand side. And you wouldn't, you could say in the copy, you could say, I don't know, uh, Charlie Adam had a, had a shocker today, didn't play very well, uh, and he, d- he wouldn't do anything. If you gave him a, a 6 out of 10, he would ring you up and he would have a pop at you all. Or, uh, the, number, the number of players that rang me up and had a go was incredible. In fact, Charlie Adam, who was sensational when Blackpool, in the year Blackpool got promoted to the uh, Premier League, went, uh, had a go at me because I gave him six out of ten in a game about nine games before the end of the season. Uh, and I said to him, right, uh, I'm not going to give you more than six out of ten for the rest of the season. And it became a running joke between us. And one game, he scored two and set two up. Blackpool won 4-3 in a fantastic game. And I gave him six out of ten. And I had all these emails from readers saying, what's going on there? I thought he was better than that. And Charlie eventually got the jokes. If you get a relationship going, you can sort of uh, get past things like that. The other thing you need a thick skin for, as I'm sort of going from bit to bit here because I'm aware of it short of time, is if you become a football writer, you will get slaughtered by fans. Fans' message boards are the bane of football writers everywhere. So I've been called all the names under the sun. 
Uh, one quite beautiful post, I uh, hope that I die of a, a particularly bad disease. Uh, because you were talking, it's the same for all journalists. You're in dangerous territory because you're all giving a, an opinion about a story or writing it a certain way. But when you write about football or sport, any sport, people are so passionate about that. And you know the old thing about, were you watching the same game as me? You will always get that time and time again. I have got a very thick skin. It never bothered me in the slightest. But I know some sports writers who get really prickly about it and can't take any criticism at all and become embroiled in big rows on Twitters with people who have a pop. I think it's fine. I think everyone should be able to have a point of view about it. And the one thing I want to get over today, if nothing else, is something I think is really important. Because you've heard, you've heard all about social media and the importance of Twitter and the importance of uh, going online all the time. But please, at your age, never lose sight of the fact that good writing is what it is absolutely all about and being different. In your three years at uni, you'll be learning the basics of writing, working out how to write a new story, which you've got to do because you come from doing your English language or whatever at A level and you're still writing essays. You need to learn how to be a reporter. But certainly when you're in your third year and moving on to your first jobs, start thinking about what's going to make you stand out because it's such a crowded marketplace now in terms of jobs. You can, you can write from your bedroom, just do things, have a blog, try and write like a journalist or not like a fan. Make yourself stand out and be different. Now, I'm going to read you a couple of the stats. As Paul alluded to, I was kind of slightly well known for being a bit stupid with my match reports. I tried to not talk about the football for as long as possible uh, because I, I, looking back, I was probably slightly ahead of my time because I realised that with the internet, and this is, I'm talking 10 years ago, the internet was going crazy. Papers were generally ignoring it, pretending and hoping it would go away and people would carry on spending 60p and buy the paper every week, which of course isn't happening. Papers are going like that. So I realised that you couldn't just repeat what, what had happened on a Saturday. By the time a newspaper came out on a Monday, you had to make it interesting. You had to make it different and give people a reason to buy the paper. So I always try to give a sort of more rounded view of the game. I'm not saying this is the way you should do it, but it just gives you an idea of being a bit different and trying to, trying to make you get, get a name for yourself, because that's what happened for me. Uh, people noticed what I was doing. A few papers adopted the same style, and I ended up getting a few gigs off the back of that in terms of jobs. So this is a match that Fulham, I've not got the cutting, sorry, uh, but, so I'll have to read it out to you. And again, I'm, this, I'm not saying this is good, but this is, this is a match that Blackpool played at Fulham, 2010, Premier League season, they got hammered 4-0, they were awful. And this was the start of my match report. This was where other papers were saying, you know, Fulham sauntered past Blackpool today, thanks to goals from blah, blah, blah. This was mine. The day had started so brightly with the sun shining on Craven Cottage, a beautiful, old-fashioned, proper football arena. It all started to go a bit weird, however, when half an hour before kick-off, the tannoy crackled into life and the announcer said in very grand tones, Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mohammed Al-Fayed. Flanked by few, five huge bodyguards, Mr. Fayed emerged from the tunnel, waving to the 500 or so fans in the ground at that point, about 37 or so of whom applauded, and then, for no apparent reason, ambled across the middle of the pitch before disappearing into the stand at the opposite end. Very odd, but then again, so is his decision to build a statue of Michael Jackson outside the ground. The six-foot-high gold statue, which appears to depict Jackson wearing ammunition belts and his underpants over his trousers, was unveiled before kick-off. I'm being generous when I say it is awful. If you've no kind of a life whatsoever, it's worth a visit. Ian Holloway is reportedly a fan of it, but it's unlikely the day will hold many other fond memories for the seaside boss. And then it goes into the report. So you get an idea of kind of what I was trying to do. Some people hated this way of writing, particularly the hardcore fans who go on message boards and just want to read about the match. It's their life to them. They go and watch the game on a Saturday. They will be down if their team loses for the next couple of days. But I always thought it was important to try and write for everyone who was reading the paper as well. So that's why I did it the way I did it. Just a quick of one. This was after the, the worst game I ever saw for Blackpool, a nil-nil draw at Millwall. This was the start of my match report. Three men are given prison sentences and told they are to be locked in a room for 20 years. But before being shut away, they are allowed to request one thing they'd like to take with them. The first man chooses his family so he can be with his wife and watch his children grow up. The second asks for a 20-year supply of whiskey to numb the boredom. The third opts for 20 years' worth of cigarettes. After 20 years, they open up the first cell and the man and his family emerge, happy and content that they've remained together all that time. The second man staggers out, a little worse for wear, but with a satisfied broad smile. Then the guards open the third cell. The door swings open and a man's voice says, have you got a lighter? 
That was the joke told to us by a steward at Millwall after the match, and worth re reproducing in full here, simply because it goes some way towards filling this page. The game finished nil-nil and was, and I think this is the technical term, rubbish. <laughs> so, uh, that was how I chose to do things, and because of that, I ended up doing a, a column in the paper, which I had to this day, which as Paul points out, has somehow got some sort of readership in America. God knows how. They might be being sarcastic. They might not actually like it. I'm not quite sure. Uh, but what, what I liked about that was that I think it gives you as a writer something to, to think about as well. It's not the same thing week after week. You can use your imagination. And this is what I want to get over to you about doing something different and being yourself. You, don't have to, you need to learn how to write in a newspaper style. But then, and this is the fantastic thing, I think, about being a journalist, you can do what you want after that. You can write the way you want to. You can come up with ideas. There's no framework that you have to write in. You can be whatever kind of writer you want to be, and I'd really massively encourage that. Don't think you're restricted by anything. Uh, as long as you've got a good editor who recognises that you're trying new things and trying to write differently, uh, then you'll be fine. And I think you've got to do that now. Like I was saying about the jobs, there's not as many around as there once was. You need to get yourself noticed, especially at your age now. You need to be different. You need to get on Twitter, start tweeting, show people what you can do. Show people, and there's so many different... Uh, disciplines now as well, as well as tweeting and writing a story, there's also live texting, there's all these different things that make up a journalist, it's not just writing stories, but whatever you do, because you'll have a talent for something, it might just be tweeting, it might be writing a story, it might, whatever it is, just, just put some thought into it and be good and be original and be creative and you'll be fine. Uh, I'll just quickly recap how I got to the BBC, I did a journalism course exactly the same as you, uh, I got a first job on a newspaper, that was funny being back, at, I was at a journalist at a great time, a journalist student at a great time because the internet, it was 1995 and the internet was just starting to, to emerge and I remember we had one computer which had the internet in our classroom and we weren't allowed to use it between noon and 2pm because America was just waking up and it'd be a bit slow. So you type to search in Google and it'd take about four minutes for anything to appear because that was the way the internet was so rickety back then. So I started at my first paper in 1997, Middleton Guardian. Absolutely bonkers place, uh, and it didn't have any any website, no email even. It was like going back in time, and that was that was a common theme amongst newspapers. They took a long time to actually grasp that the internet was going to be a great tool for them, that they could use it, and they shouldn't be too worried about it. Uh, so I, I was just a news reporter at that stage. I, I went into news, did all the local things. My the job that sticks out in my mind. There's two things that stick out in my mind. One was a woman who did a talk at the local club local women's institute club about tea towels. She'd bought, been around Britain and collected a tea towel from every village she'd been in. And I had to sit, one of my first jobs as a reporter, at the back of the room and write a story about this. I must say, I doubted whether I'd got the right career path at that time. Uh, another was a council meeting where they took half an hour to decide whether to put the traffic lights on the left or right-hand side of a, of a junction. Um, my favourite job at that paper, it was near a big, uh, there was quite a large council estate, it was the largest council estate in Europe, in, this, in North Manchester, in this patch. And I went to do... Uh, knock on someone's door about a story. And as I walked down the path, there was quite a big dog uh, on the pathway. I was saying, oh, bloody hell, I'm not, not too keen on dogs. But I sort of sidestepped around it and knocked on the door. And as this guy opened the door to let me in, the dog wandered in as well. So I walked in, sat down, interviewed him about whatever the story was. Can't remember what it was now. Uh, and we're halfway through the interview, and this dog squats on the lounge carpet and does this absolutely huge crap in the middle of the lounge carpet. And I, I stopped speaking and look at this guy I'm interviewing, thinking, is he not, why is he not doing anything? This is bizarre, absolutely stinks. Uh, I wind up the interview pretty quickly, thinking, ridiculous. Go to the, go to the door, I say, see you then, sir, now. And he stops me and says, are you not taking your dog with you? I look at him and said, are you, wait, it's not my dog. And, it was just, and he said, oh, right, and just shut the door and the dog stayed inside. It was that kind of thing, but that's... I don't know why I told you that, really. But it's, it just, to me, sums up the beauty. You see some great stuff as a journalist. And you don't really start learning until you've got out of university and you go to your first, if you get a job at a newspaper, brilliant, or you go to your first wherever you're working and you start working for a website, whatever it may be, press office or football club, whatever you get, end up doing. It isn't until you start that job that you actually learn so much. You learn ten times as much in your first year in your job as you will at uni. But what uni's great for is teaching you how to write the story and the basics of it. Uh, so from there, I went to Baltimore News again as a news writer. Then I got a job on football, and that's where I started at Blackpool. Now, I mentioned before about having thick skin. The first manager I dealt with at Blackpool was a guy called Steve McMahon. He might not mean much to some people in this room. He played for England in the late 1980s. He played for Liverpool. 
He was, you know, Vinnie Jones back in the day, tough tackling, real hard man. Steve McMahon was the first manager I dealt with. And I'd come from being number two Bolton writer at the pre previous paper to becoming the main football writer. Dead excited. I'd watched Steve McMahon when I was a kid. And I thought, this is going to be brilliant. The first week on the job, I sat next to a scout at reserve match and he told me Derby County, then in the Premier League, were watching Blackpool's left winger. So I did a story on the Thursday saying, Premier League, Derby County, I built a chasing Blackpool winger, John Hills, that was his name. Uh, and I believe he's prepared to bid £40,000 for his signing us, whatever it was. First match, dead excited about meeting Steve McMahon. Blackpool played Reading away. They got beat 3 0. Final goal was when the uh, goalkeeper rushed out and fell over, and then it tried to half clear it, hit the defender, and bounced back into the goal. The kind of football Blackpool are well known for, certainly in those days, and again now. Uh, and I went to interview Steve McMahon. He was fine. He was looking at me a bit funny during the interview. But then when the interview had finished, he said, do you mind if I have a word with you? Uh, I said, yeah, no problem. I think he was, thought he was going to say hello. It's going to be great to work with you over the next few years. Uh, we're really pleased you've got the job. Uh, and he took me into a little, it was a little boot room at uh, the Majeski, Majeski Stadium. Uh, and he took me in there, shut the door, and it was as if someone had clicked the switch. And he went absolutely ballistic, red face, standing around to me, grabbed me there lifted me so both my feet were off the ground and was screaming. The line I lost stick out my mind. Am I allowed to swear? I don't know. Yeah, okay, I won't swear, but he said, he said, you, you're just an effing effer. Well, all I would say, that's not grammatically correct. That's terrible, Steve. You're all over the place there. But that's what he screamed at me and was going, he'd kill me if I did this again, blah, blah, blah. He dropped me to the floor and he said, uh, he said, don't you dare write anything like that again and stormed out. And that was kind of the high point of our relationship. Went downhill after that. Uh, he was a very volatile bloke, but it was a real, I'm kind of glad it happened now because I, was, I would have been 24 years old at that point. And, and it really made me realise that what football writing's all about, there's a lot of politics involved. You have to be always wary of what you're writing about and who you might upset. And sometimes there's a balance in that. In fact, me and Paul, who used to work together briefly, were just reminiscing about a story uh, which happened when four Blackpool players on the way home from getting absolutely tanked up in the uh, centre of Blackpool, trashed a caravan that was parked on someone's driveway. Unfortunately for the players, the guy who owned the caravan had CCTV, <coughs> gave it to the paper, uh, wanted us to run a front page story on it. And we were all set to, but we obviously contacted the club for a comment, as you do. And there was this big thing kicked off about the banners from the club forever, we wouldn't be allowed access, blah, blah, blah. And in the end, what we did was Blackpool Football Club gave £20,000 to the owner of the caravan, if I remember rightly. And we said, we buried the story. We, we didn't run the story. And in return, we got the captain of the team to do a column for the next two seasons. There was loads of debate about this at the time with the editor. Were we doing the right thing? Should we have just printed the story? And I'm still not sure whether we made the right decision now. But it's an example of, of how it's a lot of politics when you're writing. Uh, you know, you might sort of not report on something if it means you're getting another bigger story. And this goes on all the way to the top through all the national papers to the BBC and Sky. You know, they might do deals whereby they might not report on this, but they will give you something else and, and get a better story. So uh, that was during the Steve McMahon era as well. Steve McMahon, again, when he, when he quit, this was another great learning curve as well. They did a press conference. Steve McMahon was trying to get a job at Oldham, and we'd said this in the paper. He resigned. They had a big press conference at Bloomfield Road, about 25 members of the press there, and that TV cameras. And it went on saying the chairman was there answering questions about why Steve had resigned, on and on. And then uh, someone asked, is Steve still in the building? And there was a knock on the door, and Steve McMahon poked his head in and said, yeah, uh, can I word of your chairman? They came back in after five minutes, all the TV cameras were going, what's going on here? Came back in, and he announced they'd changed their mind. In the meantime, we'd run a story that was going on a, a special late final edition with the big headline, Liar, because Steve McMahon had denied he was going to Oldham. Now, bear in mind what kind of a man Steve McMahon was to us journalists. He then changed his mind. This paper came out on the street. I cannot tell you what the next couple of months were like for me as a journalist. It was horrific. I used to get threatened. I used to get told I was going to... All this, all this sort of stuff. It was, it was awful. Uh, and I've never been so happy as two months later when Steve McMahon resigned and finally did go. But it, it's... It, it, again, it's an example of what you have to put up with. It's a really tricky job. We had Colin Hendry next, who was a really nice bloke, but not a very good manager. Then Simon Grayson, who was the loveliest bloke I've worked with. Obviously, he's now at Preston, isn't he? Uh, but doesn't say too much. 
So it's quite hard from a journalist's point of view because he talks a great game, uh, you know, says loads without giving you any lines for your back page. And as a football journalist, you have to come up with at least two or three stories every day. So Simon Grayson was not good in that respect. And again, another example during his era, Wes Hulan, now in the Premier League with Norwich, he was uh, signing for Blackpool, but nobody knew whether this deal was going to go through. Blackpool were on a pre-season tour. We're at Liverpool Airport, 6 o'clock. This is the great thing about being a football writer, where you get to go around, the, around the Europe and stuff, covering your club. Black Liverpool Airport, 6 o'clock in the morning. Wes Hulan's in front of me in the queue. There's loads of fans on the same plane, Blackpool fans. He's signing autographs, we're chatting away. Next day's paper, I obviously write, Wes Hulan will join Blackpool this season. He's on the club's pre-season tour. We land in Latvia. We get a call from the manager who's in a hotel around the corner in uh, Riga, the, centre, the capital of Latvia, saying, why have I run this story? And this is Simon Grayson, who's a really nice bloke. Why on earth have we run this story? You're now banned from the club. So I tried to say, well, he was in a public place. There was fans talking to him. This is ridiculous. No, you're banned. There's no rammer. You're not, that's it. You're not, you, you, we're not talking to anyone. So we sat. The paper had paid £3,500 for me and a colleague who was doing the website to go over to Latvia for a week in a five-star hotel covering Blackpool pre-season tour. I was allowed nowhere near it. I sat in my hotel room uh, nicking stories from the club's website. And I, was, I had a bloody great week. Fantastic. That's all I did. Just copied and then went out on the town at night. But it's... <laughs> It was bonkers, but we were banned for doing that. And, and you always have to, you always, no, football clubs are funny people, full of very, very strange, it's a very strange industry. It's not like anything else at all. So you always have to be really aware of what you're writing. And then, of course, after Simon Grayson comes, your man, Ian Holloway. And I, I, what a wonderful experience again. I, I was lucky with Ian Holloway in that I ghost wrote his column for The Independent on Sunday, so he had a weekly column. So I got to know him a lot more than other people. I remember one going to watch Toy Story with him once. I don't know how he did it. Local <laughs> cinema. And he emerged. And the lights came back up at the end of Toy Story. And I was about to turn around and say, oh, it wasn't as good as the first one, that was it. And he was in absolute floods of tears. <laughs> That's in a man. Incredible. <laughs> Crying. He's, he's, he's a great fella, really, thinking about it. Very, very emotional. But also very prickly, and as you'd heard from that clip as well. So there was a way of working these people. And there was a way of, you know... Uh, making friends, and that's a real skill. I was always very friendly with the, the chairman of the club as well, uh, and that's how you get good stories. You've got to form relationships. You can't just be walk in there and think it's all going to happen for you. You've got to work at it. Uh, so that was how I got into the job. And then, uh, then uh, 18 months ago, uh, well, a bit before that, I became a. I decided to give up the football because my dad wasn't so well, and I wanted some uh, weekends off. And I'd done it for 11 years. Travelling around the country does get a bit tiring after a bit, uh, and I. I got a job as a feature writer and I went out on the streets and slept on the streets for three nights uh, as a homeless person, basically. And it, that was what the, without doubt, the most rewarding thing I've ever done as a journalist. And uh, as Paul mentioned, I was lucky enough to win an award for that, uh, which then led to me getting a job at the BBC, which is where I now work. Uh, started off doing a football and sports drive and now I'm tending to do the sports day coverage which is like a rolling news service and that has been great as well because I've had to relearn how to write really because after working for a newspaper for so long where you saw how I wrote match reports and I kind of messed around a bit and had a good time the BBC is dead straight and uh, you know you get the facts across it's good because everyone goes to the BBC to check things this is this is the great the great thing about the site if you want the definite the definite uh, article and you know something that's going to be correct and accurate and reliable, you go to the BBC. But I had to actually learn how to write again uh, because it was just totally alien to me. So what I think has been good or where I've been lucky, and I don't know if it's still possible, I think if you're good enough it will be, is to move around. I think the, the variety and the different things I've learned at different places have stood me in really good stead. I've not stuck doing one job. I could tell after 11 years of doing the football that I was thinking, getting a bit stale here. There's only so many times you can write about a match in a different way, especially when you're club, covering the same club. If you're a national writer and you're doing different teams, it's a little bit easier. So I moved around deliberately because I wanted to improve my writing style all the time, and I still do this column, which I do every week as well. So to me, I, I, I'll wrap it up in case you ask a couple of questions, but... To me, what you, what you need to do is just, just think about your writing. Think what you're good at, you know, whatever form that is, and, and go for it. Don't let anyone hold you back or tell you it's wrong because you can't tell someone they're wrong. You can write exactly as you like. Just, just always have that in your mind about being different. You need to do that. You need to stand out. The other thing I wanted to mention as well, 
which you'll have had told you by lecturers and everyone, is offered to do work all the time. I, I got into the industry by doing going to my local paper. I know it's a bit tricky these days where you've got university fees to pay and you're all probably got in debt to whatever. I was a bit luckier and that I didn't, but I made sure I went and did free work. You will get a job by that. You honestly will. If you go to your local paper or wherever it may be that you want to go, your local football club, whatever, if you go in often enough, uh, you might have to do it for uh, six months or more, but you will get a job out of it. It's well, I can't stress to you enough the importance of doing that. That is the best way still to get in somewhere. So have a bit of get up and go about you. It doesn't come easy. The other thing is as well, and there's nothing that annoys me more in journalism than people who write a story and then just send it through. Even experienced journalists do this, and they really shouldn't. Always read through what you've done. You will. I spend an hour and a half doing one of my columns. I've written it in about 20 minutes and I'll spend an hour going through, improving a joke, improving a line, improving whatever, going through. You'll always spot some mistakes. Just always, just put the extra effort in and your piece of work, what you're doing, will be miles better. And it pays off because, you know, you can, you can, you can have a decent career out of it if you are good enough. You always will. So don't be scared about any horror stories about there not being jobs. There's more jobs than ever because of all the different forms of media there's around at the moment. And if you're good enough and you put the effort in and you're a bit unique and different and individual, you will definitely succeed. Uh, so that's all I want you to, to, to go away from this with, really. So that's it. Uh, and if anyone's got any questions that they want me to, to, to ask or want me to answer, then please fire away. Yes. And the Oystons, this has been live streamed, isn't it? Right. Uh, <laughs> you're not a Blackpool fan, are you? No. Right. You've got a tape recorder on? No. Uh, but, well, for anyone who isn't aware, Blackpool have gone absolutely down the pan. I played a blinder because I got out. They had the Premier League year, then they had another year where they got to the playoff final again, and that was when I quit after Wembley uh, that second time. Uh, and by the way, just before that Wembley final, I wrote a song. I play guitar and I wrote a song called Blackpool FC, brackets, important, off to Wembley, close brackets. Uh, and it got downloaded 21,000 times by Blackpool fans. This is what I mean about being a bit different and doing stuff. It gets your name known. Apparently, if we'd done it properly, it would have got in the top 40. Slightly gutted about that. I would have bloody loved that. <laughs> Could have made a video and everything. But anyway, that's, uh, that's by the by. My view on the Oysters is that, uh, well, obviously, they've got a lot to answer for. I mean, the thing is, they're not doing anything legally wrong if you're if you're in charge of a business you can as the boss of that business you can take the profits so they are in charge of blackpool football club they're allowed to take the money uh if that's what they want to do you could argue that it's immoral and they should have invested a lot more back and i'd agree with that they absolutely should have done because they've got some great fans at football club it's a great club with a great tradition going back to the 1940s and 50s and it's a real crying shame there comes a part as an owner where you have to do something. Their, their argument has always been, look at all the clubs that have gone under or, or close to, like Portsmouth or, uh, you know, clubs that used to be in the Premier League, even Bradford and stuff like that, that have all had money issues and gone down. He's always been very uh, clear. He will never get the club into debt. So, yeah, they've got questions to answer. They've, they've, they've run the club into the ground a bit recently and it's really sad for me, who I covered that club for 10 years and saw them go like that, to now watch them just just go downhill is a crying shame and and yeah the owners have got to take the blame the chops and change the managers and it's uh it's not been pretty to watch uh and i my successor there a guy called william watt uh has had an absolute nightmare but conversely as a journalist it's been fantastic he's uh will's done really well he was telling me a tale where he was on uh some uh, sports show in Australia the other day because they wanted to get the latest on. Blackpool's known as a crisis club now around the world and they interviewed him and they said, can you do it via Sk a Skype? Because the time difference, it was first thing in the morning. So he'd gone downstairs in his, uh, he had his pyjama bottoms on, uh, like a string vest and his hair was all over the place, eating Rice Krispies and, uh, and they dialed in the Skype and it was only then he realised it was going out live, the whole picture. <laughs> so he put his Rice Krispies away and sort of cover himself up and do this interview all live on uh, Australia. So, Sometimes, uh, you know, stuff like that for a journalist is great. One of the worst clubs you could possibly cover as a journalist is, is a club that does absolutely nothing for years and years, like, uh, like Rochdale for years until recently. I haven't got promoted for about 39 years, I think. So uh, that's pretty hard to get interesting stories out of a club. So it's been great, really, at Blackpool. There's been loads to write on. And for me, it was fantastic. Going around the Premier League grounds for a year was wonderful. Some of the press boxes, if you ever get a chance to go to Arsenal Stadium, there was a five-course meal with a menu in the press box. Fantastic. We had all this scrub before kickoff. I'd, my dreams had come true. It was amazing. So uh, that was after years of going to rubbish football grounds. So I've not really answered your question, have I? Yeah, they've got a lot to answer for, and it's a real shame that the club's, uh, that the club's struggling. But that's football. It's cyclical. I'm sure they'll come back. Yeah, lads at the back. 
Could, could I what, sorry? I can't hear you, the microphone's not working. What, sorry, what's the next question? <laughs> sorry, I don't know what's wrong with it. I think it offers a challenge, but I think, as I was trying to get across to you, if, if you're good enough, you'll sit back and, I mean, I realised early on there was no point just reproducing what other people were doing, and you had to do something different to get yourself known, and you're right, there's loads more these days. The clubs, football clubs used to have, the, uh, sorry, the newspapers used to have all the power, there was no websites, uh, they controlled the clubs, the clubs needed them to advertise tickets or whatever it may be and to get the message of the manager across so the, the newspapers had all this access then of course it changed with the internet coming out suddenly the football club didn't need the newspaper it could have its own website where it didn't need to put adverts in the local paper it could get across uh, everything it needed to on its own website could interview the manager so yeah it's difficult because all that information is already out there plus you've got radio plus you've got fans tweeting during the game putting vines on or whatever it's difficult but I think you shouldn't be scared of that as a, as a good writer. You should, you should welcome that because you can show how good you are. The, the thing is, there's so much crap out there. There's, there's a lot of rubbish that's written and only the good stuff. The cream will always rise. So if you're good enough and you see it as a challenge, then you, you, can, you can improve what's out there and you can better it all. And that's how you can become known. Because if you get a name for yourself as being someone who's, look at his stuff there, that's brilliant. Why has he got all those retweets? Or why has he done that? And that's how you start to, to get known by other organisations as well. And... Uh, yeah, it's challenging, it's tough because you have to be good to be heard, but for the people who are good and who can have, have make a f decent fist of it, then it's, I think it's great, it's a great opportunity. I wouldn't, I, I think there'll always be a place for, for good writing. Uh, I mean, if you look at the BBC website now, it's, it's all about short form, which is where they break. If you look at the feature now, or a match report indeed, it's all broken down into little sections so people can read it on the mobile phones because you don't want one long, long chunk, chunk of piece of writing, yeah. Uh, but, uh, but I think there'll always be a place. If you've got a really good piece of writing, people will read it. I mean, it's, it's a fact. If it's good enough, then, then people will, will enjoy it. It's like a good book, isn't it? You might argue the books are going to die out as well. They could well do. But... If something's good enough, you will read it in whatever form. So I think the fact, uh, again, you're right, it's, uh, the younger generation don't pick up a paper and your Monday match, who wants to read an account of the match 48 hours after it's happened? I totally get the point, yeah. But I think that's why there's a lot more on the whistle stuff as well. Newspapers are making a real effort now to get all the stuff on there on the whistle. But I think there's always a place for a really considered view of, of an event, whatever it may be. I mean, all the stuff about Paris at the moment, uh, you know, what happened 40 hours ago, but you're still getting really... E emotive, brilliant pieces being written. I think that's where newspapers are really, really important and where they're really good, where they can, they can rise above all the stuff that's on Twitter and on social media or, or whatever, on websites, because they tend to still have the real good writers. And I think, I think there is a place for anyone who can write well. I don't know where it'll go. I always argued that papers would never die out, and now I'm doubting that. I think they probably will, but I think they will survive in some form, and it's imperative they do, uh, because... That's where some, some real, real good writers are. But again, opportunities elsewhere for, for, for the likes of you. You can set up your own stuff from your own bedroom and get, and get known that way. As long as you're good enough, you will, you will succeed. Right, and that's enough from me, I think. Yeah, we can just say thanks. thanks very much indeed. Cheers, staff.